Would you open your Bibles this morning to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. But the other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad fellows from the marketplace. And they came and these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them. They're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king, one called Jesus. I want to preach this morning as the Lord shall guide in this existential reality in which we are living. I want to talk about dog whistles. Write them in that chat. Write it in that chat. Dog whistles. There is, my brothers and sisters, such a thing as a dog whistle. Many of us are acquainted with the instrument that is capable of emitting ultrasonic, ultrasonic sound at frequencies that are undetected by the human ear, but clearly discerned by animals like dogs and cats. The range of their hearing is much greater than ours so great that trainers often use these, in, these instruments, these dog whistles, to give instructions to their animals while not disturbing the humans that are present. But my brothers and sisters, dog whistles are also a part of political speech, our public vocabulary, as they, signal, or they, as they are signals to a select crowd, to persons who hear issues on designated frequencies, that these statements are directed to them. Many of us remember the dogs set loose on civil rights protesters and dogs that were regularly loosed in our communities. Dogs heard the sound and knew what to do. Now those same commands are heard through words and statements. And what is frightening is that so many of our people are conversant enough with their history to pull out the code book and decode the instructions. These statements, my friends, these statements and signals go over the head of the masses, but they land squarely at the feet of the designated group who interpret what is being said through the decoder of their own experience. Let me see if I can lay out the case. William Sapphire, a speechwriter for 
Richard Nixon and a columnist for the New York Times described it this way. He said, there are messages that seem innocent to the general audience, but resonate with a spe specific public attuned to receive them. This is what we call loaded language. Rhetoric used to influence an audience by using words and phrases with strong connotations associated with them in order to invoke an emotional and or exploit some stereotype. We've heard these dog whistles, my brothers and sisters, because now the frequency over which they travel has been lowered so that all of us can hear them. We hear them so frequently that we know it's a signal when we hear them. Oh, let me preach this thing. We, we don't hear the use of the N-word anymore, or not much at least not in refined civil conversation. Nor do we openly disparage blacks or Latinos or gays. But we blow whistles now, dog whistles. And we use terms that take us back to the words some want to use. We've heard these sounds. Welfare cows, welfare cheats, tough hombres. A little shaky, states' rights, forced busing, global special interests, radical left, radical right, law and order, stay back, help me somebody, stay ready. We must save our suburbs. Where's the birth certificate? rioting and looting, dog whistles. But, but let me just add this. One of the founding events of our country was a riot, the Boston Tea Party, as the colonies refused to buckle to oppressive laws and be treated like second-class citizens of the British realm. How do we disparage black people? Talk about black inner cities, rioters, squeegee kids, and a connotation of the repulsive will rise in person's consciousness and cause them to want to act against the interests of those the whistle has been programmed to guard them against. Let me add, my brothers and sisters, we are standing in a moment when the dog whistles are being blown and many are listening and taking direction. Can I preach like I want? Oh yes, my brothers and sisters, the dog whistles are being sounded. The word is out that you can barely buy ammunition. I wonder why. Gun sales have gone through the, the roof. I wonder why somebody's heard the dog whistles. But let me help you understand something. Let me help encourage your heart today because I did not come to preach doom and gloom. See, this is not a new day phenomenon or some recently conceived strategy by those seeking to energize and deliver a certain audience. No, my brothers and sisters. This method was employed to even stymie and stave off the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dog whistles. Luke details one such moment, but he also shares the results because many people are afraid of the dog whistles, but keep listening to the end of this sermon. The Apostle Paul is making his way through the Greek cities after crossing into Macedonia, after feeling a Macedonian call, come over and help us. And now he's on new ground carrying the message of Jesus Christ. 
He's a foreigner. That's why the text opens up saying that he's gone. He's, he's over there. He's left Philippi. And now he and his companions have passed through Amphipolis and they've gone through Apollonia and now they've come to Thessalonica. This is about a hundred mile journey. They are foreigners. They are, they are from Palestine. They, they are from the Jewish community. They are immigrants or aliens in this land. They've crossed over and they're carrying the message of Jesus Christ. A foreigner, an outsider, a Jew who has converted to Christianity. Luke records the results too. As a good Jew, he goes to the church or rather the synagogue every, every Sabbath. He sits among those who are the elders and the believers in the Jewish tradition. He is in the city of Thessalonica, and it's an important city. It's a city that has linked commerce between the East and the West, so much so that the success of Christianity in Thessalonica would propel it across the known world. This is a strategic spot for Paul to set up shop and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. If he is successful, the gospel goes east and the gospel goes west. The Bible says Paul preached and oh, did he preach. And while he preached, persons started hearing his message. He told them about Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. God has raised him from the dead. And the Bible says some of the Jews were persuaded to believe in Jesus Christ. And they joined with Paul and Silas and a, a large number, get this, of God-fearing Greeks came along and quite a few women. In other words, persons who had been seated there now came along. They got right with God. And as a result of it, powerful people, or at least persons in the Jewish community who took this as an offense, an outsider, an alien, an immigrant, somebody coming over here, preaching some foreign gospel, grabbing folk and getting them to go his way. They caused a riot. They started bringing together folks saying, Paul and Silas are here and they're turning this place upside down. They're trying to cause commotion. They're trying to stir up things. And they caused a riot brought people together, these men, and came to, and brought people together and caused a confusion all in the city of Thessalonica. And finally, they go before the magistrate, magistrate because they are determined to take down Paul. They are determined to take down Silas. They are determined to take down the gospel. I need somebody to write in their chat, determined determined to take it down, to take down the gospel, to stop it from going from place to place. And they went to the magistrate and they blew the whistle in front of the magistrate. These men, these men, these men, these foreigners, these outsiders who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them into his house they are defying Caesar's decree. And here comes the whistle, saying there is another king, one Jesus. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the line that was meant to ring a bell <clears throat> with the magistrate and all of those standing there with him was this line, there is another king. One Jesus. Help me somebody. That's the dog whistle. Oh, they're here preaching about another king, a man named Jesus. Help me somebody. This was meant to set the magistrate and all of those with him off and cause them to rethink their actions and reconsider what they do. Why? Because it was a capital crime. It was a capital crime to make predictions about the realm. Those blowing the whistle thought they were just on sound to the crowd as if they're making a statement. But it is a capital crime to make a statement about a possibility to overthrow Caesar and for someone else to step in in charge. Meaning that if the magistrates followed the letter of the law, Jason and his people would be killed. 
Paul and Silas would be put to death and this ministry effort would be canceled out. Help me somebody. They were trying to imply, to infer something about this faith and the people who follow it. Help us God. But Paul and Silas, Paul and his team were not dissuaded from their mission. Somebody missed that. I'm preaching this because my brothers and sisters today, the whistles are being blown. Oh, they're being blown all around us. The whistles about our race, the whistles about our faith, the whistles about where we live, the whistles about our abilities. Every minority community, every oppressed community is hearing the sound over their head and they know that that whistle is being blown to awaken and alert a certain community to rise up and to stand against those who are declaring it is time to be free. Can I get a witness? Oh, that whistle's being blown. You hear it every day now. We letting them in now. Stand back. I heard it this the other week. Stand back. You gonna pray your way out of this? Oh, you go to that church? I have places to be on Sunday morning. Prosperity preachers in those mega churches. The whistles are being blown. Whatever your community is, whatever community you are in, listen for the whistles. They are alerting communities to stand against you. People who would yesterday be on your side are now hearing whistles that for which they are trained to respond another way. The whistles are being blown and the enemy thinks he's poised to win. I, I've been looking over the things that have been happening over these last several weeks and months. My God, we've gone from overt action, or rather covert actions. That means things done in the darkness, from clandestine activity to straight up in your faceness. We've gone to things just being declared. We, we listened to the debate over who should take the seat of RGB and we heard it move from a seasoned jurist who is unbiased in his or her thinking to actually trying to stack the court so that certain legislation will finally be turned back. And there are so many vital issues coming before the court in its next season. And the dog whistle is being sounded to say, no matter what you feel about other things, let's make this prominent or you might lose what you have. My God, I need somebody to get on board. It is time to understand, my brothers and sisters, the dog whistle is being blown. They are being blown, but the New Testament tells us, oh God, help me preach this word. The New Testament tells us, do not think the gospel stopped because of a dog whistle. Don't think that that dog whistle stopped the New Testament any more than the civil rights movement ended in 1896 with Plessy versus Ferguson. They blew the dog whistles for one reason. They blew the dog whistles because they were threatened by change. Preach, Walter Thomas. Somebody needs to decry it. Somebody needs to cry it loud and spare not. Do not think that dog whistles are blown from a sign of strength. Do not think that people are acting these ways now out of a position of strength. They are doing it from the last dying twitches of a dying system that has promoted injustice, that has promoted oppression. I know that there is a new rule out now to stop talking about the system for what the system has been, but only those who have lived through the underside of it can tell what it's really been like below the boat. Don't ask, don't tell me what I live through when you have been in the sunshine 
blind and I have been in the dark. Don't tell me what I have eaten when you have sat at a table and I've only had crumbs. Don't tell me about health care when you can get stuff nobody can get and we can't get stuff anybody can get. Don't tell me about privileges and rights. They are threatened by change and they are threatened by change because these are the last twitches in the dying ember of the fire of oppression that must go out for freedom to be enjoyed by the people of this land. Help me somebody. They were threatened by change. Notice I didn't say they didn't like change. Notice I didn't say they didn't want change. I said they were threatened by change. Paul started his preaching in the synagogue. And to his amazement, and to their amazement, many Jews and Gentiles took to his preaching. And many converted to the new faith. And they became followers of Jesus Christ. The Jews were offended. They had these Gentiles coming to their services. And now with one stroke, Paul was leading them away. There was an envy and jealousy erupting in that community. Preach, Walter Thomas. See, when you're threatened, you're threatened because of what the Bible says. The Bible says, the Bible says, where there is envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. I need somebody to write in that chat, there, are, there is envy and jealousy. There is envy and jealousy. They didn't want to see Paul succeed because they felt, uh-oh, he was taking something to which they and they alone were entitled. I lift this, my brothers and sisters, because this is at the root of racism and white superiority. This is at the root of oppressive forces in our world. This is at the root of what is happening in every minority community that is feeling a knee on its neck. There is a sense that somebody feels they have privilege. They are the only ones who can enjoy this right. They have the privilege and they are the entitlement in this country. And we may not want to address it, but it exists my brothers and sisters, it does exist. A difference exists because there is a difference in opportunity. Everybody is not given the same opportunity. Preach, preacher. America did not intend to allow slaves to hold and to have the same rights as those who were landowners and white. The class and caste system erected a hierarchy best described in one of the statements attributed to a past president. Let me read it to you so I get it right. If you can convince the lowest white man that he's better than the best colored man. He won't notice you're picking his pocket. Give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Persons feel someone is getting something to which they are entitled. Some of us are old enough to remember when General Motors was under great stress. Why? Because it was making these muscle cars in a time when gas prices were going up. And little people like Toyota and Nissan were sneaking in and Honda and taking away the lion's share of business. Many of the folk who worked in those Nissan and Toyota and, and in those Honda plants were looked down upon and had to suffer all kinds of abuse because the people who were working in the American corporations were feeling like they were taking their jobs. Help me somebody. They were entitled to keep them. These other people from across the country were not entitled to them. America has a history of putting down 
one nation after another, one group of people, the Chinese, the Irish, the Italians. There's a great scene in the TV show I've been watching of late Fargo where the Italians do not like the African Americans. They do not like them. They lord it over them. And the African American man says to him, say, you don't understand. The rest of these people don't like you any more than they like us. And one of the big Italians gets shot and they carry him to a, a white, at that time, a white hospital. And they refuse to treat him just as they would have refused to treat a black man. Somebody here needs to understand you do not need to be threatened by change. Why? Because when the opportunity gets spread, God has it so fixed that all of us will learn to unite together. Because whether you know it or not, we are all in an oppressed community. Blacks, whites, gray, whatever you want to call yourself, we are all in an oppressed community. There's the straight and gay. There's the Catholic and Protestant. There's the black and white. There are the haves and the have-nots. Everybody is in one oppressed community. But the gospel has a way of saying God can unite all of us and we do not have to feel that way. They were threatened by change, but I came in here to tell you, not only were they threatened by the change that Paul and Silas were preaching because they felt they would be left out in the cold. Let me add this. When you hear the dog whistle being blown, people are threatened by change because they are afraid of the change that the gospel offers. God, I feel like preaching this. If you go back to the history of America and the history of the black church, you will see that African American individuals, really African individuals were not allowed to be a participant in the worship services in the white churches. Some of them were allowed in the balconies, but that's all. And so what happened was we found our own churches. We had to found the African American or the African uh, the African American came to form the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and then the National Baptist came the Black Baptist uh, they began to develop and then the Church of God in Christ comes along we began to develop why because the gospel had a way of saying I'm offering you something that'll set you free can I preach what I want in other words the truth of the matter is this the gospel ushers us into a change that we've been powerless to enact ourselves oh my brothers and sisters they can blow dog whistles till the cows come home but the beauty of this moment is that the gospel that we are hearing empowers us to make changes in ourselves and in our world that we are powerless to do ourselves I can I can't fight all of the racism in America. I can't fight all of the classism and culturalism in America. But when the gospel stands up in me, I began to realize that I can be strong where I used to be weak. I can be powerful where I used to be weak. And in other words, I began to realize that what I really was fearing is what I'm really looking for. I was afraid to deal with this or afraid to deal with that. But what I'm really looking for is a gospel that sets me free. Do I have a witness here? Is there anybody here who knows that the gospel gives you courage you can't imagine living without? I'm celebrating the courage that the gospel gives because I was threatened by the change. I said to myself, if I change and give in to this gospel, there's so many things I can't do. People who are saved and in church don't do this and they don't do that. Oh, my brothers and sisters, don't limit your conversation to what people don't do. Open your conversation and let the Spirit talk to you about what you will do. You will stand before the enemy and the enemy will back down. You will fight the good fight of faith. God will let you speak things that are not as if they are so and they will come to pass. When you deal with the one power that is the power, the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and when you start realizing that God raised him 
him from the dead. And that that same power that was at work in Jesus is now at work in you. You'll begin to start realizing that the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You'll no longer be afraid of the changes the gospel will create in you. Why? Because the gospel will make you strong where you used to be weak. The gospel is not giving you the power of fear, but it'll give you the power of love and a sound mind. It'll help you fight battles you never thought you could fight. When you realize that the resurrection has really happened, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and that if God raised Jesus from the dead, he can sure handle whatever problem you're facing. They can blow dog whistles all the way to November the 4th and they can blow dog whistles all the way to December the 17th and they can blow dog whistles all the way to January the 21st or whatever day the inaugural is but those of us who have heard the gospel in our hearts will not be deterred and will not step back we will not be afraid of the terror by day nor the darkness by night why because greater is he that is in us than a he that is in the world. If God could raise Jesus from the dead, then God can handle the ballots in America. God can handle the poll watchers at the polls. God can handle anybody who rises up to take away our opportunities and rights. I don't know what what tomorrow will hold. I hear folk running around going crazy, talking bad and talking smack about what to expect with the election. I move beyond all of that and I put it in God's hands. This script is in God's hands and I need somebody to holler. He's about to do the rewrite. Y'all ain't feeling it. I need you to look at somebody and tell them this thing is so crazy. God's gonna rewrite the script. Y'all still ain't got it. You won't be able to stand and watch oppressive forces win. You've got to believe that the God who is on our side is about to rewrite the script. Blow the dog whistles. Call for all the dogs. But the Lord is on our side. God is with us. Our God is on our side. I need you to write somebody in that chat and tell them the Lord is on our side. The Spirit tells me to say, the Lord will fight my battle. The Spirit tells me to stay. Stand still and see the salvation of God. The Spirit tells me to say, after this, you'll know that I am the Lord God Jehovah. The Spirit tells me to say, the dogs are coming, but the armies of heaven, the God of the angel army, has got angels encamped all around you. The story ain't over yet. The record ain't closed yet. God ain't through yet. Why? I'm closing now because our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Do I have a witness here? I need somebody to declare. Blow the dog whistles. But watch out for the angel army. Watch out for the angel army. They're on their way. They're on their way. And if God be for us, who shall be against us? Our 
God is greater. They're threatened by change. Supreme Court in its next setting will be able to revisit so many freedoms that people have thought they could enjoy. Dog whistles blowing. Dog whistles blowing. If black and brown people become the majority people in this country, what will it mean for those who have singularly held power? Dog whistles are blowing. Let God change you. Because whether you know it or not, everybody's in some minority community. God's trying to bring us together. Threatened by change. You threatened by changing into this person God wants you to be. Don't deal with what you're giving up. Deal with what you're getting. Oh, sometimes when I stand before hurdles and hills and realize that God is with me and I square my shoulders and I lift up my head and I march forward and I see a way made out of no way doors open oh my brothers and my sisters dog whistles blew dog whistles blew dog whistles blew get those images in your mind of those dog whistles when they blew and pictures of cross bearings etch across your mind churches burned and bombed Dogs released, murders taking place, deaths on our city streets. And somebody said that should have shut it all down, but it didn't. We saw marches, people coming out their house. I will not stand down. We've seen an awesome onslaught. Should have caused us to quit, to give up, but the spirit that Jesus gave to us makes us stand up, makes a Martin King march, makes a LBJ sign of voters' rights, makes a Barack Obama get sworn in, African Americans serving on front lines as first responders, our power in Christ is greater than what's against us every time. The record ain't finished yet. Don't you close the book because of what you're hearing now. Our God, our God is greater. I want to open the door for that brother, that sister who's heard this message today. I want to invite you to get up. Come on and try Jesus Christ for yourself. Paul preached about him getting up from the grave and said this, if God could raise Jesus from the dead, he can sure raise you in whatever trouble you're in. Whatever's going on in your mind and your life and what's going on in your world, he's the answer. I want to invite you, my brother, my sister, give your life to him. I remember the day I got up and walk down the aisle. I heard Dr. Carter preaching, repentance, the key to life. And I heard in my spirit these words, no matter how good your life is, Jesus Christ can make it better. And I took him at his word that day. And I'm here to tell you, he'll make it better. Come on and try him for yourself. Come on and step up and walk on down this aisle. Give me your hand. Give God your heart and let the Lord work a change in your life because our God, our God is greater. Come on and bow your heads with me in prayer. If you want to give your life to the Lord today, if you're on our stream, just hit that button that says e-member and it'll take you right in 
where you can just sign up. Our people will be right in touch with you. If you're on Facebook Live or if you're on YouTube, just right now, pull up an email and send it to amen at newsamus.org. And just say, I want to give my life to Jesus. We'll take it from there. My brother, my sister, oh, you'll hear the dog whistle. But you'll know you're walking in safety. You won't run when the dogs come. You'll be like Daniel. You'll sleep all night amid the lions. Somebody better hear me. You'll be like Paul and Silas. You'll sleep through an earthquake. You'll be like Peter locked in jail when they were waiting to bring him up the next day and kill him, and an angel opens the door for him. You'll be like a president who said he was going to send troops to the city, but the people kept on marching, and the troops never showed up. Nobody but God. He'll do it for you today. Come on and try it. My brother, my sister, it's time today to give Jesus Christ your life. I have no regrets that I gave him mine. I hear all these dog whistles, but the God of the angel armies has them encamped all around me. And whether you know it or not, God is rewriting the script. Oh, you hear that in the background? Who can stand against? Come on and bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we come praying to you. The dog whistles for the black community. The dog whistles alerting folk to the Hispanic community. The dog whistles alerting folk to the gay community. The dog whistles alerting folk to the impoverished community. The dog whistles alerting folk to the urban city dwellers. The dog whistles alerting people to the suburban poor. The dog whistles are being blown everywhere. And we're hearing them and we're alarmed and we're nervous. But God, I come on behalf of the brothers and sisters here. Remind them of the great power that's at work in them. Remind them to yield more to you. Not worry about what they can't do, but to start walking in what they can and will do. Open their eyes like Elijah prayed for his servant in Dothan, who said, I, I see the enemy all around us. And Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes. And when his eyes opened, he saw the angels, the horsemen, and the angels behind the enemy. And he realized he had nothing to fear for the angelic forces were at his defense. God, in this moment in history, in this place, we give the script to you to make rewrites. And we know that the angels are encamped about us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God, our God, our God. Somebody needs to start shouting right now. We're getting ready to go home, getting ready to go on our way. I need you to start shouting and praising God. Our God, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Praise be the Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance round about you. And the Lord give you peace. Now go out and live to his glory. Hold your head up high and know that God is on your side. Shake somebody's hand in the spirit and start praising him around that house and in that car. Sing it out, God. Sing it, sing it, sing it, sing it!